So um, why don't we get started today with Madeline, who's going to um, do an Indigenous land acknowledgement for the group. Uh, sure. So I live in the town of Rochester in Ulster County, um, which is littered with what feel like slightly outdated and politically incorrect historical markings about the Indian raids from the Asopus Wars. Um, and the Estopus people, which were a tribe of the Lenape, they were um, smaller groups that lived right along the banks of rivers and um, stretched from the Catskills into Kingston. And they were the, uh, the tribe that had the first interaction with Henry Hudson, I believe, um, but that they were the ones who repeatedly tried to kind of fight him off from trying to farm the lands that they were farming. And they eventually ceded some land in Kingston to him and his people said, you can farm this and we'll keep the rest. And uh, that transaction sort of kicked off the Asopus Wars, which I had not been very familiar about or with until maybe last Thanksgiving when um, I asked around what people's opinions were on the best Thanksgiving pie sellers. And I kept hearing from multiple people that everyone agreed that it was Saunders Kill Farm, which is the second oldest continuous farm operation in the United States. Um, but that they all have conflicting feelings about buying their Thanksgiving pies from there because those lands were gifted to the Schoonmaker family by Peter Stuyvesant in payment for his military efforts the family's military efforts during the Asopus Wars. So everybody kind of has this like Thanksgiving discussion with themselves. <laughs> so I had looked more into it um, when I was doing the research for this because I was interested in whether or not that family learned their farming practices from the Asopus people. So it sounded like they did to some degree. But um, one of the more interesting things that I ended up learning was there was an educational farm right down the road from where I grew up in Mansfield, Ohio, uh, Malabar Farm. And there was an abandoned Native American settlement on the southern end of the farm that was kind of an educational center. And it turned out to be where the Asoka people settled after they were pushed finally out of the Hudson Valley by the Dutch settlers here during the Second Asopus War. And I felt like I feel a little more connected to them now than I ever have because my life trajectory has ended up tracing kind of their eventual path. Um, but they, the remaining Asopus peoples now uh, live in Oklahoma mainly and have, have stretched looking for good farming land but sounded like the best farming land that they had ever found was around here. So anyway, that's my acknowledgement. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so fascinating. I, I did not realize the amount of relocation that happened from our area. Um, and it's like a geographical journey, like to Oneonta and then over to Pennsylvania and then to Ohio and it just kept going and going and going farther west. Yeah. Yeah. It's <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so yes, everyone, thank you for joining us. Today, we're so grateful for our guests, Alana Kettle-Tucky, Corey Allen, and Jessica Clegg. And um, the intention of this session is really to create a space where we can engage with the issues of climate and environmental justice. And we don't want you to think of this topic as you know a one and done session, but really rather an opportunity to develop a new lens through which to look at your town and your work, a new way of asking questions and a heightened awareness of what perhaps we've been taking for granted uh, in our environmental work. So climate and environmental justice really sit at the intersection of people and community and all the practices that go into how we as a society um, use our resources, our land, our water, um, and how we treat the earth and how we treat each other. 
And in New York State, with regard to climate work, there's definitely more of an effort in recent months even, um, I think, to, to point more funding and awareness um, to underserved communities when it comes to the work that New York State is, is really pushing when it comes to climate. And I also think that this is a very interesting time with COVID, you know, disproportionately impacting people of color and people who are already facing economic hardship. Um, and, and I feel like we're really now just looking into the eyes of the harsh realities of our American history and maybe realizing that it's not just history, it's also our present. Um, it's not just our past. So, um, and so much of the COVID pandemic has also been um, kind of a foreshadowing of some of the climate impacts that we will see coming, um, such as uh, climate migration, for example, you know, connecting back to Madeline's uh, um, history there of relocation and dislocation. And here in the Hudson Valley, we've definitely seen a tidal wave of wealth hit the real estate market here. And this term was new for me, this green gentrification term that speaks to perhaps the unintended consequences of uh, rehabilitating, um, in particular in upstate New York's very aging housing stock and our industrial past. So um, it's not surprising of course, that the most economically and socially vulnerable in our communities are going to be the most severely impacted by climate change. But now our eyes are open to it in this moment. And um, it's up to us to really think about and ask ourselves and each other, um, how can we do the work? How can we do the work to ensure that the lens of equity can be brought to bear with our climate projects right here in the Hudson Valley? So today, our three guests are each going to give a brief introduction to their own work. We're all gonna hold our questions till after they've all presented, um, and then we'll have a discussion. So please, if you have questions, um, jot those down and hold them till after the presentations. Um, but definitely be thinking about what have you noticed in your area and um, how does this relate to your own work? So first up, I'd love to introduce Alana Kettletucky. Alana was actually on our selection committee for local champions. So we're thrilled to have her join us today um, to talk a little bit more about her work at the Office of Environmental Justice at the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, in her position, Alana focuses on crafting materials and messages to improve communications between environmental justice communities and the agency as well as analyzing policies related to climate justice, adaptation, and social resiliency. And in addition to her work for the Office of Environmental Justice, Alana has served as the Deputy Director of Legislative Affairs and has worked on diversity, inclusion, and education and public outreach with the Office of Communication Services. Alana comes to state service after several years working as a governmental relations associate with the Adirondack Council, a non-for-profit organization dedicated to the preservation of the Adirondack Park. And prior to this, she served as the government affairs coordinator for the Empire State Pride Agenda. Um, Alana holds a Juris Doctorate from Albany Law School and a bachelor's degree in political science from SUNY Binghamton with a minor in sociology. And she's married with four children, ages five to 16. So very busy lady. Thank you again for being here. <laughs> and in her limited free time, she enjoys hiking, nature walks with her children and kayaking. Um, and she lives in Troy. So with that, please, Alana, take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me share my screen. Can everybody see? All right. So as was stated, I work for the Office of Environmental Justice. Um, I 
Oops, Corey, if you wouldn't mind if you could mute, just we're hearing some background static. Thank you. So the Office of Environmental, of Environmental Justice has been uh, at the agency since 1999. It was created in response to a uh, presidential executive order from uh, President Bill Clinton that directed all state agencies to, state agencies, federal agencies to consider environmental justice and environmental justice principles when dealing with low income and minority communities. Uh, so our office uh, operates sort of as a way for environmental concerns, environmental justice concerns to be implemented into all of uh, the department's programs. So whether we're talking about, you know, dam building, we're talking about permit applications, or even just talking about planting trees, the goal is to make sure that we're considering the community and bringing them in from the beginning to have conversations and to discuss what they would like to see. So our goal is to make sure that these communities, these low income and minority communities that have been historically disproportionately burdened uh, with environmental harms have an opportunity to have a say in what happens in their neighborhoods, which has been sorely lacking for so many years. Uh, so as folks may or may not know, uh, environmental justice as it is defined is the fair and meaningful involvement in treatment of all people, regardless of their race, their culture, their national origin, even education level. Uh, the goal is to make sure, like I said, that um, everyone gets a fair and meaningful participation with respect to the development and implementation and the enforcement of environmental regulations, environmental policies on uh, multiple levels. At this point, we can really only kind of control it at the state level, but the goal is to try to make sure that these principles are implemented even at the local level as well. Uh, when we're talking about low income and minority populations, uh, this is what we're speaking of. Um, the map is really just there sort of as an example. The map is very woefully, woefully out of date. <laughs> that map is from, uh, based on the 2000 census, unfortunately, we at the DEC haven't had an opportunity to update our maps uh, since the 2000 census, but we are absolutely working on it. So do not judge us by this map alone. We will be updating them. But we minority populations, including African Americans or Blacks, uh, American Indians, uh, Nazca Natives, uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and Hispanics, typically uh, non-white Hispanics. And then we have the low income thresholds, which are, you know, less than the poverty threshold that's established from the Census Bureau. So when you're, we can tell, we call these areas, if you'll see the area that is sort of highlighted in purple, it's a potential environmental justice area. So if you ever see that on our website, we call them PJAs, potential environmental justice areas. Um, we are actually currently view, uh, looking at redefining some of these areas as uh, instead of environmental justice, using the term disadvantaged communities to make it consistent with the most recent uh, legislation from 2019, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which is going to, part of that is, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, is the climate justice working group that's creating a definition for disadvantaged communities. And we're sure there's going to be some overlap. So there is a move towards uh, sort of redefining and using some different terminology. Um, so the, our program, we have several different sort of programs or I, things that we work on to, you know, move in the process of environmental justice along. We work with our DEC programs and occasionally with our sister agencies to try to make sure that we're uh, providing guidance to our programs with regards to public participation, engagement, and uh, implementing environmental justice principles. Uh, another program that is under the umbrella of environmental justice is our Indian Nations uh, consultation. So basically it's us acknowledging that we have mutual interests uh, with regards to preserving cultural resources and natural resources. And so we try to advocate on behalf of the nations uh, and collaborate with them to protect their rights. And so we assist them in, you know, protecting cultural resources, uh, basically the rules are they come to us. We don't go to them. So when there is an issue, they will come to us and ask us if we could come and consult. Oh, it jumped away, didn't it? Um, let's go back. There, come on. 
oh wow it just doesn't want to do that okay so we're just going to do it like this it's fine it's fine technical issues um basically they come to us and request a consultation and typically we act as a liaison between our nations and other programs, our nations and sometimes other agencies and nation in our nations and uh, sometimes you know businesses business interests. Um, our Indian Affairs and Nations consultation uh, consultant is Dr. David Witt. He's an archaeologist and was a former permanent administrator. So he has a background and uh, is pretty good at working with our nations and has developed. Uh, a good rapport and develop some trust with some folks, which has been something that has been sorely lacking for a very long time. So it's very good. Our most popular program is our environmental justice grants program. Uh, the goal of these grants is to, and it also ends up kind of being a focus um, point here when it comes to green gentrification. Uh, the goal of our grants is to sort of remedy a lot of the environmental harms that have been uh, created by this disproportionate, the disproportionate impacts and from years of not allowing folks to be involved in the environmental process. So it goes for uh, multiple different projects, a uh, lot of community gardens, water testing, soil testing, green jobs for youth. Uh, we have a grant that goes towards creating uh, urban environmental education centers, uh, so we kind of runs the gamut when we, with our grants, uh, we also have a science, because we are a regulatory agency and we're a science-based agency, all of our grants have to have some sort of science and research-based component. So every single one of our grantees uh, delivers us a report at the end. So if anybody's interested in looking at that, that is available on open data. If anybody wants to kind of take a look at some of our grantees, take a look at some of the reports and some of the really amazing work that they've done. Um, one grantee I kind of want to point out simply because they are, you know, concerned with the issues of green gentrification is uh, Groundwork Hudson, uh, amazing organization. And one of the main uh, items I wanted to point out is the picture you're seeing here, which is the science barge. And the science barge is just this fantastic. We just recently paid to help um, uh, do some repairs on the science barge and it, it's just it's a fantastic program uh, unfortunately there i am i'm back <laughs> um, yeah let's say i was frozen for a second <laughs> Sorry about that. So the Science Barge is just a great resource. It acts as an educational tool. It also uh, provides produce to different communities. It's been an excellent resource, especially during COVID when you had a lot of folks who didn't have access to produce. It really, it, they delivered, I, I wish I knew the exact numbers and I apologize for not noting the exact numbers, but they delivered just pounds and pounds of fresh produce to the neighboring communities. And it's a great place for public schools to come and learn a little bit more about the environment. If you are interested, um, you can visit their website and actually do a virtual tour of the barge right now. They're not doing a lot of public tours because it is you know, coronavirus, but if you're interested in looking, I, I highly suggest you check out Scenic, uh, Scenic Hudson, sorry, <laughs> Groundwork Hudson's website. They're an excellent, excellent partner. Um, so to get into a little bit of um, what I was discussing before, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, um, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the goal of it is to uh, reduce our emissions levels to uh, 1990 levels, so by 2050. So it's a pretty large task. And part of that uh, is the Climate Justice Working Group. So it has representatives from our program, from state agencies from New York City communities, from some upstate rural communities, uh, it's us, NYSERDA, Department of Labor and Department of Health uh, included. And the goal of the Climate Justice Working Group, come on, did it do it? Oh my goodness, things are frozen again. Anyway, ah, that didn't work, we're gonna skip. So anyway, the purpose of the Climate Justice Working Group is to establish criteria for what is going to be considered a disadvantaged community. Uh, the, they are currently working on that right now. They're creating a rubric that will 
determine what the definition of a disadvantaged community is. And once that definition is determined, they'll then generate a list of communities that fall, that meet these criteria. And once the, that list is created, those specific communities will be quote unquote targeted for uh, direct investment and spending. So the goal is to make sure that these, the investments are at a minimum 35% of the overall benefits. So uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of these communities, in addition to being historically overburdened, are also historically underfunded. So this will be the attempt to remedy the underfunding by making sure they're getting at least 35% of the overall benefits of spending. And that can go to a whole multitude of things. And the goal will be to make sure that the communities actually get a say in what it goes to. We're not going to be the ones who are telling them that this is what your program, this is the program that's being implemented. This is where it can go. The goal is to make sure that the communities can sort of self-determine. And if you wanna learn a little bit more about that, I put the link to the Climate Justice Working Group. You can also uh, just Google climate, New York State Climate Justice Working Group and you'll find that. You'll find uh, the previous meetings. There's also a list of the Climate Justice Working Group members if anybody's interested. Uh, the last thing I want to point out that uh, we're working on in the Office of Environmental Justice, I am one of the co uh, cohorts for the Climate Smart Communities Equity and Justice Working Group. So the goal, that working group came about while I was working on Climate Smart Communities uh, Adaptation Subgroup and we were updating uh, several of the actions for Climate Smart Communities and we were trying to implement equity actions and environmental justice principles. And we discussed the idea of social resilience of uh, perhaps implementing equity on a much, much larger scale and what that would look like. And some of the topics that we hope to cover through this working group are green gentrification, are equity focused uh, options and uh, trying to implement environmental justice principles in, in encouraging local communities and local governments to implement environmental justice principles and to also promote inclusion and at that level because they're it's so important to make sure that you know doing things on a state level is fine you know it's important but it's really most important to make sure that these things are being done at the local government level it's almost I don't want to say useless for the state to kind of enforce some of these things but it really doesn't I don't think it really gets, you don't see the full impact until you actually see it from a local government level. Um, if I, if I, did I get it all in 10 minutes? Let's try to make that fast. There's a lot of stuff in here and I wanted, I didn't want to go over time because I know we don't have a whole lot of time. But that's sort of like a brief overview of what I've been working on, what the Office of Environmental Justice does, uh, what we're tied to. And I will stop sharing my screen. Alana, thank you so much. That was amazing. And um, yeah, we're, we're so thrilled to have you here as a, as a resource for our discussion. Um, so next up, I'm going to introduce Corey Allen. Corey is a lifelong resident of Newburgh and has over 20 years experience in community organizing and political being. Um, and he's worked on countless political campaigns as well. Um, has some some hands-on experience there and his previous experience in working for the city of Newburgh as the assistant coordinator of teens united to rebuild Newburgh developing programs for children ages 7 to 15 um, and he's also been the assistant athletic director at the uh, boys and girls club there as well as campaign coordinator on two city council elections uh, for the board and a board of education election. He's also worked on Congressman Maloney on his recent 2013 campaign and Frank Scartados on his most recent campaign. And lastly, with former Obama advisor and state assemblyman Michael Blake's campaign. Corey's the co-founder of Financing Your Freedom, an organization that teaches financial literacy to the community. Uh, and he's also a board member of uh, Community Voices Heard. So um, we're we're so thrilled to have Corey here. And Corey, do you do you want to share your screen, or would you like to just speak? 
And all honesty, I don't have anything to share with my screen right now. I will tomorrow, but um, I probably have like five slides at the most, but yeah, nothing right now. Okay. Well, go ahead. So please just tell us a little bit about um, your work at Habitat for Humanity and uh, how you see the climate movement playing out in, in Newburgh. Well, um, my role at Habitat for Humanity, I'm the neighborhood revitalization coordinator. I've been at for five years. Um, some of the stuff you read on that uh, in terms of like my description, my, my past, it's a little old, but um, I've done a lot more stuff recently. I've been involved with maybe like three campaigns after that. Um, that was Scar Tados, uh, I think it was first campaign as a state assembly person. But um, I've been involved with uh, local campaigns. Um, I sit as the chair of the, of the local city of Newburgh housing coalition. Um, also, like I said before, neighborhood revitalization coordinator. My job as neighborhood revitalization coordinator at Habitat is to know all things neighborhood related, all things housing, from uh, being connected to the legislators here to being connected to the community. Um, our policy of neighborhood revitalization is that of rather than us going to a neighborhood and putting a family there saying, hey, you guys are homeowners now, we'll leave you to your own devices. That's not our practice anymore. We want to do. Uh, we want to approach neighborhoods from a holistic uh, standpoint. I Meaning, we want to work with neighborhoods, uh, with other homeowners, and tenants there, people who may not own homes, to for the uh, uh, overall, uh, for the overall um, goal of getting neighborhoods to function as best they can, to be healthy in every way, financially, um, educationally, and and physically. So what we do is, um, if we're going to build a home on South Miller Street, one of our, I'll take South Miller Street, our last flagship uh, uh, neighborhood that we're building, on, that we built on. We built about seven homes on South Miller Street. When we entered South Miller Street to build these homes and to put homeowners on this, in, in this neighborhood, um, where there were a bunch of abandoned properties, what we did was we came up with products for the surrounding neighbors as well. We call it a brush with kindness. We had home repair program for those folks that wanted to get some debts done um, and get some minor repairs done to their home. So that enabled us to connect with the homeowners there already who are non-habitat homeowners. So once we went in there with our habitat homeowners, put them in there, we created what is called the BRDNA, the Broadway River District Neighborhood Association. So we got these folks who had common, common uh, uh, issues together. Um, at first, when I went to them and spoke to them about starting a neighborhood association, um, we had talked about starting what is called a homeowners association, where your fees for the homeowners association will be drawn from your, your, uh, your mortgage every month. Now, because the original plans for this neighborhood and for two of the neighborhoods we work with were to have a homeowners association and we registered with the state. Um, it was my job to call the state and to see if we could get that dissolved, which it was dissolvable, so we can create, which is the same thing, neighborhood association, minus the fees being automatically pulled. So I had a meeting with our homeowners with this particular, you know, this uh, particular topic being, you know, the topic of discussion, the neighborhood association. I discussed with them the homeowners, homeowners association and the fees being pulled. One of the neighborhood, one of the neighbors, um, the homeowners in our neighborhood, in our East Parmena Street neighborhood, got 14 other homeowners together to say that, hey, we don't want to do this homeowners association where we have additional fees being pulled out. We don't want to pay more money, basically. So he had 14 homeowners on there. And from there, I was like, perfect. We don't want you guys to do this. And you guys are already organized. He had done the organizing for me. So... From then, we had started, you know, I'd gone on, gotten the people in that neighborhood together to do a bunch of uh, projects, neighborhood cleanups. Um, we've partnered with other people, um, other organizations in this area like RUPCO, Safe Harbors. We've partnered with the neighborhood, uh, the, the Newburgh Ministry to get these folks to do certain things, um, get certain things done in their neighborhood. We've applied for grants and have gotten approved for grants to improve the neighborhood as well. We got approved for a $14,000 grant a few years ago. Um, we got approved for two 
$2,000 grants, one for South Miller Street and one of the other for East Parliament Street, which are our focus neighborhoods. And basically, right now where we stand with these neighborhood associations in the neighborhoods, we are right now on South Miller Street, we've connected with Scenic Hudson, and um, we're doing a street trees project, actually. We're going to be planting trees on Mother's Day. So basically, the work that we did to get into these neighborhoods, we went into these neighborhoods asking the people what they needed. First and foremost, do you want us to work in your neighborhood? Do you want us to see, do you want to see a neighborhood get better? What can we do to help your neighborhood get better? Once we listened to them, we brought them services that they wanted. Um, the neighborhood, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, brush, with, uh, brush with Kindness projects, the home repair projects. We heard their concerns. They said, hey, how can I as a homeowner benefit from your presence here in this neighborhood? How are you gonna benefit my, me, being that I'm not a Habitat homeowner, being that I'm here as a homeowner that has been here for years, how will you benefit me? Do you have services for us? And we were able to offer services to those folks. Now, fast forwarding, um, this street trees project that we working on with, with Scenic Hudson right now. Yes, we had pushback from folks. They came to me and said, hey, we want to work with you guys on planting trees. Now me, I'm of the mind that um, there is a, such a thing called gen, green gentrification, that whenever you see projects in neighborhoods um, being pre uh, presented to neighborhoods and, and whenever you see people coming to neighborhoods uh, saying, hey, I, I fell in Newburgh. I, I went to Newburgh, I visited Newburgh and I fell in love with it after two weeks. Whenever you hear these folks talking like that, you ask them the question, the same questions. Okay, cool. Where'd you move to? And they'll, they'll say things like Chamber Street or Lander Street, the neighborhoods where the black folks are in. And that right there, gentrification, I, people say re-gentrification. There's only one phrase, it's gentrification. Ruth Glass herself coined this phrase in 1964. She's a German sociologist who coined the phrase. She was in the UK, downtown in the black neighborhoods. And she had noticed that the money from the people from the middle class and upper middle class, the gentry class, were going to these neighborhoods and putting money in these buildings. And that would attract other gentry to do the same thing. Thus creating a, for lack of a better phrase, an ethnic cleansing of them, those areas. You saw black folks in those areas move and have to be, have to relocate and you didn't see the area looking like it did before. So I have a bunch of the folks here coming from New York City and Newburgh because we're 50 miles away from New York City. They move here, they buy property here. They say they fell in love with the, with the, with the neighborhoods, with the hood, as they call it. I fell in love with it after two weeks and decided to move to where black folks are. Knowing that their mere presence is going to increase the cost of living for everything. So when they come here, they get here and they create these little, uh, um, organizations and these little boards, transportation committee, beautification committee. We want to do projects here where we, you know, in your neighborhoods where there's been a historical, uh, historical record of, of, of people being displaced, not even displaced, um, um, benign neglect. Your needs have never been tended to, never been seen before. We never attended to your needs. Well, instead of actually answering your needs, we'll bring in other people, give them things right in your neighborhood. And then we'll bring uh, uh, ideas like crosswalks and bike lanes to where you live, not addressing what has gone on before then. So now you have all these groups and they look like one thing. You have, and so now you're in a black neighborhood. You see white folks moving to your black neighborhood saying, hey, we want to improve the, the, the transportation. Let's put bike lanes out here or these, this flower pot out here. Or let's say, let's bring in these folks to plant these trees. And you're doing it in a neighborhood that has classically for decades upon decades, intergenerational inter has been denied services, denied resources. And then we go in there and we say, hey, we want to plant trees or we want to do this thing with the bike lanes. The people in those neighborhoods naturally say, get the hell out of my face. What do you have up your sleeve? And the people there, because they, they, we've seen it. When you look at the city of Newburgh here, we have certain neighborhoods where they've done beautification projects and where they've been classically black neighborhoods and these projects are taking place. And now you see restaurants, 
They remind you of Hudson, New York or Beacon, New York, where white folks can walk right past where all the, the blight and all the, the, the hurt and the pain is going on. The neglect is taking place. They'll walk right past it and go right to their restaurants. And you see these beautification projects in these neighborhoods around these restaurants. And you hear people say, hey, we want diversity. We want words like diversity. We want diversity. We want to help people of color, BIPOC. But it's all talk. So at the end of the day, when you're looking at going into neighborhoods and doing these projects, you have to look at, there's a buzz phrase. When last year, when the pandemic hit and we saw everyone witness the murder of George Floyd by police, right? They, they got a chance to peek into the, the black the life of black folks for about a couple seconds. Wow, these cops are doing this to black folks, even though it's been going on for a long time. The world was on standstill and we were allowed to look into that for a little, a couple seconds. They started using words like pre-existing conditions. Black folks have been suffering from pre-existing conditions. That makes them more susceptible to things like COVID or and other diseases. They don't have this type of service. Um, they haven't had access to foods or access to, to equal funding in anything, despite the history of this nation telling us that there have been policies that were supposed to the, you know, provide that for us. So now with that said, we talk about these pre-existing conditions when it comes to COVID. But when we look at neighborhoods, we have to look at pre-existing conditions. And the pre-existing conditions in these neighborhoods that we're going into must be considered before you go into these neighborhoods to work with. Otherwise, the people in those neighborhoods are gonna say, here come these phony folks coming here trying to make way or make provisions for when they move us out. Because when those beautification projects come about, best believe you're going to see a, an increased interest in those neighborhoods from people who with money. Every time there's talk about Newburgh, um, Newburgh uh, streets and development and, and, and revitalization, then the, the narrative always is centered around or it begins with bringing in outside money, developers from this other area, developers from this area, but they never consider developing from within. So you have a people who have been under benign neglect, meaning that the government's going to ignore them and hopefully they'll just go away for years. And then it bubbles, everything bubbles and it pops with George Floyd and everyone sees and they say, we have these pre-existing conditions. I implore all of you, when you walk into these neighborhoods, be familiar, familiarize yourself with the pre-existing conditions of the neighborhood. Know what those people are going through. Know your history, learn your history. Know that the folks you're going to be dealing with and talking to about environmental justice and and, and, and trying to you know, get these environmental projects off the ground, know that they suffer from a lifetime, generations before them of benign neglect and, and injustice. It's kind of crazy. Um, whenever there's a, a, any kind of project here in Newburgh, someone comes along in the neighborhoods and they go to talk to folks, we wonder, what do you have up your sleeve? Because in the past, there's always been something up people's sleeves. So the most important thing I want you guys to take from this is the outreach is probably the most important aspect of any project you're doing. Before you go into this neighborhood and say, hey, let's plant some trees or this neighborhood needs this. Go in there and find out what the neighborhood, like what caused the neighborhood to be the way it is. We don't have any jobs. Like we have people, like around here, people get killed and we'll come together and lament. And we'll talk about, yeah, put the guns away, stop the violence and stuff. But we never have the people that with the jobs at these events. They're never there to say, hey, I know you might be in the streets. You know, you guys are, this community is suffering from this specific uh, uh, hindrance. And there might be streets, people in the streets, and we know what that consists of. So we got the people here, you know, the job givers here to give you an alternative to help you. That never happens. We never have diseases or anything 
uh, or any hindrances or anything looked at and diagnosed properly and say, hey, we're going to address this and diagnose it properly. My mother, I tell people all the time, in 2002, she had stage, pre-stage one breast cancer. We were, they, they caught it before it was stage one. So her treatment was, a proposed treatment was, they gave her a localized um, radiation treatment on her left breast, removed part of it and gave her a localized radiation treatment. After that, she was to be on tamoxifen, which is a, uh, a, a pro, a pro uh, remission drug afterwards. Fast forward 10 years later in 2012, when she was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer, the plan was to remove her stomach and give her chemotherapy. Now, the reason why I bring this up is you have two different cancers, two different therapies. Well, now, when it comes to people in, of color, as people put it, they like to umbrella us and put us and shoehorn us into the same category all the time and say, hey, these folks suffer from the same problem. When no, we suffer from different cancers. So my thing is, when you go into these neighborhoods, look at the neighborhood, look at the neighborhood, see who, what it consists of. There are BIPOC people there, which is a very popular phrase they use, but black folks, we don't like that phrase. There are black folks here, there are Hispanic people here. What is their history? What has gone on in this, in this block? How can we get the trust of these people? We got to go in there with noble aspirations and say to the people, hey, we don't want to displace you. We want to work with you. What do you need? And then you go from there. That's the best way to get any buy-in from anybody is to go in there humbly, being well-informed, knowing who you're dealing with and having noble aspirations for that neighborhood. And I'll, I'll mute my line. Corey, thank you so much. Um, I think that this idea of going and listening to the community really, um, it's well-timed with the group that we have on the call because we're all beginning the, uh, in the beginning phases of the task forces that we're putting together in our towns. So it's a, a really great time to just go into our communities and listen and, um, and hear what people need. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so last but not least, Jessica Clegg. Um, thank you, Jessica, for joining us. Um, Jessica's over in Kingston and she works for Citizens for Local Power. Um, she organizes energy efficient education and, um, and green jobs programs. Um, and we should know, we did have Julie Noble uh, as a presenter earlier who talked with us about Kingston's really impressive work um, on sustainability. They have a, a, a goal for 100% renewable energy use by 2030. Um, and they have a lot of interesting work that they've done with the, with the population in, in Kingston. So um, Jessica has um, over a decade of history in publishing and communications. Um, and she's also a trustee and a treasurer at the Kingston Library and volunteers her time writing and planning with the Midtown Arts District. And um, specifically, we invited her today to share with us uh, a bit about the green jobs training and internship program that she helped to develop and um, and ran a pilot program of, of that. Um, and the good news is they intend to run it again. So um, Jessica, please take it away. Sure. I'm gonna share my screen um, and also uh, thank you for the, the tips on sharing the screen. I think, well, hopefully this will work. And I just wanted to say, let me um, get to um, presenter view. Hopefully that works for everyone. But I, I just wanted to say to Corey and to Alana that those are seriously tough acts to follow. And uh, I really appreciate learning about your your and you know actions. And here we're saying empower Kingston because that's what we're trying to do, but it, it's very clear that you're empowering um, through through your own organizations. And I just really appreciate hearing about that. 
Um, so we, as Empower Kingston is a campaign of Citizens for Local Power, which as uh, Vanessa stated, is an organization designed to share energy, um, education and uh, help connect people with resources to update their homes. We're also, uh, that's awesome that Julie Noble spoke with you because we are um, assisting in public engagement for the Climate Action Plan. That's very exciting. And Julie is a, a remarkable ally. So um, just a little bit of background. We um, started the idea for a green dot Green Jobs internship um, going back now, God, probably about a year. Like we uh, were doing sort of grassroots meetings with different community organizations and developed a local contractors group based around Kingston. And uh, the number one topic of their concern was that we're lacking a workforce that can do these jobs or, you know, connections for people to have the training to do these jobs. And it was just, there's a sort of a disconnect between, um, between the contractors, between uh, the education and training available, which at the time wasn't as hands-on as maybe could be. Uh, and so we decided to just create something. And so we, we did. Um, we, we did a one month paid internship um, and uh, we had uh, between four to five contractors who were working on different skills that they could get a sense of what their interest level was in different areas. And as it says, yeah, we also had supplemental education. Of course, we started this last September. So we had to be very cautious about COVID and uh, probably would have done more um, more in-person classes if, if we could have, but we did a lot of uh, online training to supplement. Basically, the interns were working um, about 24 hours with two, then additional two hours of online training and a check-in. And uh, yeah, these were the topics that we focused on. We had a lot of really great partners in the area that we developed. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Sun Common, but they really pitched in and helped um, to um, you know provide a great experience. Also, Jay's painting, um, Anthony Aibi, and uh, and. Uh, and then we also had HVAC and electric work. Um, I would say that we got very lucky in a way. Um, this is something that's going to develop how we go forward, but we actually had a majority of women and people of diverse backgrounds applying for this position, which may have been partially due to the fact that it was maybe through a nonprofit and not to go directly to a contractor. I think that there are still certain hurdles that that some women may feel about going on site and, you know, like, you know, it's a pathway that is something it might have felt more comfortable. And so, so most of our interns were women. Um, we had eight in total. Um, which was what our capacity was at the time. We're planning to expand that. Um, and they really dug in. Um, like some of the projects that they were working on, if this is familiar, I know some of you are in the area, like uh, uh, the African burial grounds in Kingston, which is still being finalized and is becoming uh, the, the building on that site is becoming a community center. So that was what a lot of um, the interns got to work on. Also the um, Point of Praise, which is more downtown, a church that has erected a solar array in with relationship to Sun Common, which is a really cool concept. So basically 
they some common they had land on their property that was um they were thinking of using for some sort of low-income housing but it wasn't really working due to the like due to it being rather marshy so it just didn't so they partnered with sun common and were able to build this huge array um free of cost to them um because sun common then takes part of the profit and then they can provide free energy to their elderly members of the church so so that was something that we got to work on too and we're hoping in the future to continue to work on sort of like really forward thinking community projects that, you know, expand perception as well as provide skills necessary to get into this, um, get into these roles and also, you know, inspire people to continue. Um, we had a range of ages uh, and um, backgrounds. We had, um, we had a special needs, um, person who had a, a job coach on, uh, it's actually Xavier on the left of the screen here, who's awesome. I just spoke with him earlier today and he's doing great, still working with one of our contractors. And it started out that he was um, needed to have a job coach sort of guide on site with him. And then as he, cause he'd never really been able to find a job that was that he could stick with. Like he was working in some restaurants and stuff and he just like, you know, it just was difficult. But after about a week, he was able to bond with some of the contractors that we had and just, um, and he was good. Like he just, he's still working with them. And um, it, it was just really cool how he sort of, grew into the role and what he was telling me this morning was like you know every day there's something new and there's something like you know interesting about each project each day and you you're constantly learning and it's uh, you know it was it was it was nice to hear that so uh, currently um we have about uh six of the eight interns working with various contractors that we had in the program. And uh, the other two, we had one person who is um, who's an immigrant. So I, there's, I think they're still awaiting their status, but it was, it was great to be able to be inclusive about that. Um, and, you know, we're all in touch. We um, uh, just had, I think this is the African burial ground for the most part building the, um, uh, the center and um, yeah and some of our contractors also like who took on the interns afterward like have um, specifically Joe McJoel who's of Jay's painting like he, he was amazing like he would take the interns to like you know make sure that they gave food to um, needy people and you know cook massive meals and you know we just we've been able to partner with some really really wonderful people. And yeah, these are just a few quotes. I mean, I, I can share this uh, after if you, if anybody's interested, but um, overall, um, I think one interesting thing, cause we did is interviewed everyone who applied and, um, and whom we accepted. Um, and we actually had um, a considerable a considerable number of applications, I would say like, um, I think it was like 30. I mean, it doesn't matter that much, but it was definitely like, maybe seemed to indicate a need or an interest. And pretty much everyone, when we were asking like, what's inspiring you to apply for this was saying, it's actually like wanting to be a part of taking action towards climate change and being a part of a movement and just taking direct action, feeling like you can actually put your hands into something and, and do some good. So that was a cool insight from our survey. 
And then another great thing that came out of that, um, our program, our little tiny program, was that we sort of, we got into a, a deeper partnership with Ulster County and their Office of Employment and Training and um, have now been able to create more of a synergy. Um, so Ulster County um, has a green careers um, program right now where they're really honing in and focusing and they will, they have funds so they can put towards um, either additional training through our local institutions um, or on the job training so they can supplement the contractors for interns that want to continue on past the month that we have for our program. And as you can see, they have a number more things I can um, provide, uh, definitely provide contact for from that department and any materials that might be of interest. Um, but it, it's been um, it's been a very beneficial relationship because as we go, we're sort of putting the pieces together, I guess you'd say, like between between our, our little program, between uh, the, the countywide initiative to um, increase green business and development and between the educational resources and um, a big piece of our picture is uh, community engagement. So as far as what's next, and uh, please feel free to use the link or you know reach out, I can provide my contact in the chat. Uh, we are very lucky to have had funding from the county for a program in June, um, which is going to come up <laughs> like tomorrow, but it's great. It's very exciting. And so that's currently in development. And then um, we're planning generally to have at least two month long projects, uh, internship programs a year. So this year it's going to be June and September. And um, next year, maybe we can handle one, like three if, if we get her, you know, considering how many uh, sponsors and such we get. Uh, we were very lucky to get um, this one grant and we're applying for a NYSERDA grant to help us partner with um, SUNY Ulster in order to run um, the next three. Um, so it's looking good. It seems to gather a lot of um, momentum when you talk about it. And it seems to also luckily sort of spur on the county and local um, organizations to get more involved with this issue. So I think that's, I think that's good. Thank you so much, Jessica, that was great. And thank you to everyone, um, all the presenters for the very thoughtful presentations. Um, so now Vanessa and I are gonna moderate a discussion between the speakers and we'll leave time for questions. And um, just thought we'd start with a basic question, which is, so all of the local champions here, all of our cohort, are there in very rural towns? Sorry for the motorcycles outside. Um, and, you know, it, it may not be as obvious as it might be in an urban setting like Newburgh, uh, but we're just wondering how, um, you know, a question for the presenters, how might one of them know there are environmental justice issues in their community? How might they seek that out? And then of course, as Corey was saying, and all of you were saying, you know, find a way to address that um, properly. And maybe we could start with Alana if you have insights on that. Absolutely. Um, I think what some folks don't realize or remember is that the environmental justice movement has its roots in the civil rights movement of the 60s and began in rural communities. It began with people of color in rural communities noticing that they were being zoned, that a certain uh, filthy and dirty you know, industries were being zoned within just steps of their homes and that they were starting to notice very severe health impacts from that. 
So I think that lately it's sort of seemed as if environmental justice has be, you know, that, that people automatically think that it's urban, but it really does have its roots in rural communities and in low income communities that have seen, like I said, an over, you know, burden of uh, environmental harms. And so for people who maybe are questioning whether or not they're an environmental justice community, uh, I, Oh, and I know that not everybody's always comfortable with the term environmental justice. Uh, I always use the term, you know, overburden. Do you find that you have a large number of facilities, either electric generating facilities, landfills, et cetera, that are about maybe a mile to a mile and a half from your home? Are you noticing that you're, for example, you can't plant in your soil? Is your air quality, you know, poor? Have you noticed that, you know, people seem to you know, contract certain illnesses. Are there high levels of asthma, heart disease, diabetes, uh, different cancers? And usually when you ask folks about these issues, they tend to sort of like a light goes off, like, no, this, yeah, we, we do have these same, you know, things that go on. I'm like, then you, you know, this is, and you also, if you're finding that you don't have a say when somebody is proposing, you know, a facility or there's an update to, or a permit is being updated that nobody's come, you know, contacting you. You don't know this until it already happens. Um, and I think people, you know, said there's, it, it's a racial connotation that has been connected to environmental justice. Cause like I said, it has its roots in the civil rights movement. And so I think there has been uh, sometimes, uh, you know, hesitance from a lot of low income rural white people to sort of associate themselves with urban people of color and, issues, but I we have been moving away from that and moving closer to people realizing that the that there is, you know, environmental racism and then there also is environmental justice that affects them directly. Thank you, Corey or Jessica, do you have anything to add to that? Um I don't know if, if Corey certainly probably has more. I just, I, I really, you know, I appreciate those thoughts and, and it's something that our organization is actively trying to um, see how we can best address. Uh, I think someone mentioned Repco earlier and we are, you know, we're partner friend with Repco, um, but they, they're they stressed, you know, so some of the building stock that they have you know, subsidized for tenants um, is in bad shape. And uh, we did one housing um, audit. One of our members is, uh, is a building scientist. And and it was just like the, the air quality and ceiling and everything was just so bad that, um, you know, we were able to get her towards another place. And now currently we have an action um, a partnership with Bard College to um, basically do housing abatement, like, you know, like kind of just ask people in the community, because I think it's also a very sensitive thing to people's home quality and what their, you know, what the problems and issues are. So, so we're getting some um, interns who are going to go around and sort of just ask people you know, some easy questions. And then if they agree later, we'll go back in and do a, a, build, a housing audit and sort of provide those results both to them and to Repco to help hopefully make decisions that, or guide towards decisions that, that could help with some of those, you know, housing health issues, which is so prevalent here. It's, it's terrible. Thank you. Um, and uh, Corey, I wonder if you could speak to um, ways that, you know, environmentalists could be allies, because I know when we first spoke, you were talking about how people would come in and even, you know, artist communities would try to revitalize neighborhoods and it really wouldn't be helpful. And also, if you have any thoughts on um, ways, you know, signs that gentrification or green gentrification is happening in rural communities and, and things that our, you know, our cohort here could look out for or ways they could respond. Okay, perfect. Um, environmentalists are indeed allies to, uh, as, as they say in uh, 
the not-for-profit world, underserved communities. It, let's be real. They're very, they're indeed allies to Black communities everywhere. Um, as you see with certain cities where Black folks are, the uh, population, or pretty much the most, or the majority of the population, like in Michigan and in the South, where you see towns where they're they're doing dumping right next to the cities and the people are getting fumes and you see environmental injustice throughout history alana was correct she was i agree with her a thousand percent especially with the, that it stems from a lot of pre-existing conditions and the best way that environmentalists can be allies to black folks in these neighborhoods um, is in all honesty, I think it's just it's it comes down to being empathetic, being able to put yourselves in the people's uh, shoes, those who you're serving. Um, think about where they're coming from. A while ago, I was at the uh, I was part of a a workshop put on by the city of Newburgh. It was hosted by the city of Newburgh police, and there were a bunch of agencies there talking about how to approach certain people who your agency works with. And the police, uh, I think it was a lieutenant at the time, was telling people, hey, you're going to see some people when you approach them, they'll be drinking, they may be smoking weed, but don't be afraid to talk to these people. And they showed, they went on to show six slides of, of groups of Black men, young Black men, young Black boys and Black men. And I'm like, wow, if you have to teach your folks at your agency how to approach these people, then you failed as an agency hiring those people in the first place. So, because those people that it's 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 important that when hiring and and in the service industry that we're working in that we hire those people who will be most effective at getting to those communities that need the most help and the most attention. It starts there. Also, it starts with um, it, it also includes, you know, looking within. Are we really, really, really trying to make a difference here? What are these people really facing? Most people, when you go to the neighborhoods, you're gonna be dealing with people who are parents and have lives already. Like when I deal with people in, in the, the political realm, political uh, 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 ideology, it's tough. I can't get five people together. It's, it's, it's the toughest task in the world because everyone has their own lives. But finding a common denominator issue in the area you're working in, finding that those issues that those people suffer from that they can all relate to, that's where the conversation begins. And then you can tie, then that's when I would tie in the environmental aspects of the points where we come in, hey, did you know that this neighborhood is, you know, part of a, an area that's been underserved for years? And we, we come with data and let them know, hey, your issue is being addressed. We know what your issue is here. We see the issue that you guys are talking about and we have solutions for it that include you being uh, part of that solution itself, as opposed to us coming in, giving you activities that you're going to enjoy for a little bit, but then you won't be able to afford later on down the road. Great. Um, well, I have a million more questions, but I also want to make sure I, I leave it open for um, our cohort to ask questions of our speakers. Unless, Vanessa, do you have another, any other question you'd like to ask our speakers? Yeah, I would, um, I would love to First off, yeah, encourage our cohort to share with the group if they're, um, you know, how do you see this playing out in your own towns um, and, and ask any questions that you have of our speakers. Um, but I did wanna make sure that I ask uh, Alana, following up on her presentation, and she was speaking about the Climate Smart Communities Program and the Environmental and Climate Justice Working Group. And I was just wondering if she could share, um, you know, even if it's early days, what what are some um, what are some thoughts that that working group has about how communities like the ones we have on the call here 
um, can be integrating these concepts into their work? Um, or, or is the working group thinking that there will be specific actions that are like, you know, EJ actions? Or is it more like this will be infused throughout climate smart communities? It's kind of a little bit of all of that. We definitely are going to be taking a look at the actions as they exist now, seeing where we can implement equity actions, seeing if these actions are even valid or useful anymore, or if they just need a wholesale rewrite. Uh, we also are looking to develop actions that are very specific to um, injecting equity, justice, and inclusion into the process for different um, for anybody who's looking to get qualified under climate smart communities. With regards to, and we also want to make these actions and frame them in such a way that you don't necessarily have to be a climate smart community in order to implement them. It's been a long time goal of the Office of Environmental Justice, as I said, to try to um, encourage local governments and municipalities to implement environmental justice and diversity and inclusion uh, activities within their uh, zoning, within their uh, planning boards, all of that. And so if you know, climate smart communities happens to be the best way to do it, that might be the best way to do it. Uh, the goal is also to create a sense of social resiliency. Um, it's going to be completely impossible to uh, plan for the next uh, environmental um, danger, the next uh, you know, extreme weather event, or the next pandemic if we don't have social resiliency measures in place. And you can't have these social resiliency measures in place if you're leaving large swaths of people out of the conversation. Uh, so the goal is to take all, all of that in mind to you know, make sure that we're creating not just climate smart communities, but you know, socially smart and responsible and resilient communities. Um, all of the uh, things that we use for and all of the uh, things we use to implement adaptation and resiliency can also be used on a social level. So the goal will be to one, encourage folks through the climate smart communities, looking at the actions as they exist, and then also developing some actions as well. Uh, we're very, very early in the process. Uh, we are, you know, have only had maybe three meetings so far. So it's, it's very, very early in the process, but our ultimate goal is to try to have at least one action drafted and up on the website by 2022. Okay, thank you.